Join me, Nina Lockwood, as I talk with people who express their creativity in ways that can inspire the rest of us to recognize our own creativity. Because creativity is not just the domain of a select few. It's who we all are. And if you enjoy these conversations, please like, subscribe, and share them. Thank you. Welcome to Creativity Conversations. This is episode 39, and today I'm with the lovely, talented Del A.D. Jones. Del, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for thank you for having me here. Indeed. For those of you who haven't been on this call before, we have the opportunity to talk to different people from all walks of life who understand the nature of creativity, they embody it, and they share it with others. So I'm going to read Dell's bio, although we all know that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we'll see where it goes from there. So Dell is a three principles practitioner, teacher, mentor, YouTuber, blogger, mother, and host of insightful conversations. Thanks to her unconventional childhood growing up in the UK, which we'll talk about later, her former career in Hollywood and her personal challenges, including a divorce and raising children as a single parent, Dell's practice is informed both by the empathy gained from real life experience and her deeper studies of spirituality and psychology. One of Dell's specialties is helping people find the way out of codependency and narcissistic abuse through the understanding of the three principles. Using her relatable approach to coaching and her commitment to creating a safe space to explore the inside out understanding, she continues to serve a wide range of clients both locally and remotely worldwide, which is the way we're all doing it these days. Exactly. And to learn more about Dell's coaching and mentoring packages, you can go to her website at www.dell80jones.com. So welcome. So nice to finally have you here. Thank you. Gosh, you have such a beautiful voice. I could. I, I was falling into that lull of, of a beautiful feeling just listening to you. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. There are probably people listening who don't know what the three principles are, and I wonder if you could just give us a short version of what it is and how you do your coaching and mentoring from that perspective. Gosh, um, well, the three principles refers to the combination of mind, thought and consciousness. And I'm going to leave it at that <laughs> because um, I often joke that I wish Sydney Banks, who was um, really the the man that had the enlightening um, experience and and saw how the system works behind how we experience life. I often, you know, wish he had called it something else because people tend to think, oh gosh, three principles. What are the three principles to live by? Like you know, one less four agreements or <laughs> four less seven habits of highly successful people. <laughs> but um, so it's, yeah. So what Sid was pointing to was the fact that we experience life um, moment to moment via our thinking in the moment. And um, many of us are certainly in Western, Western culture are brought up to believe that everything we feel is a result of our circumstances and the people in our life, that the feelings are coming directly from them. And what the principles points to is that there's actually, you know, our reality is created within us via our thinking. We feel our thinking. That was um, revolutionary to me for many, many reasons, because I think I felt very much a victim of my life and my circumstances for most of my life. So I was always running around trying to control everything on the outside so that I would feel better. So that was one of the main things I saw um, with the principles. And the second thing that was really life changing for me, I think, was um, knowing that the thoughts in my head were not personal to me. I used to think that that sort of that little sort of litany of um, beliefs I had about myself that I was 
lacking or not good enough or, or damaged or defective or whatever it was that was going on, on in my head, I used to think that those thoughts were telling me something about myself. And when I came across the principles, I learned that that's not true. That's just the energy of thought just moving through me. <laughs> um, basically, those types of thoughts were up for grabs by anybody. I had just sort of, you know, snatched a few of them and created this persona called Dell from those thoughts and thought that it was pretty solid and that's who I was. So that's um, another thing about the principles that was really life-changing for me. Uh, and there's just so much more. The fact that we're spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. Um, and at that spiritual level, we are all created equal. Nobody is a little more spiritual than anybody else. We all show up a little bit different in the world of form, you know, in our little... Um, the human expression of our spiritual essence all is slightly different mm. and wonderful. And, and I love that, that we all show up slightly uniquely different, but, you know, at our essence, the majority of who we are, we're all equal. So that was also a life-changing thing for me to see that because I grew up feeling very, very damaged, less than, and not equal to anybody else. And I lived from that place for many, many years of my life first first 50 years of my life put it that way <laughs> it's a long now, time <laughs> maybe this would be a good place to explore a little bit if you're comfortable with it talking about that unconventional childhood of yours that you mentioned mm -hmm. well um yeah it was you know it it's so interesting I mean I you know I used to I used to sort of tell this story and people would be going oh my God, you have to write a book or um, wow, or things like that. And, and as, as challenged, challenging as it was in many, many ways, it was also, um, there was something really wild and exciting about it too. <laughs> so, so basically, um, but that's also not to uh, diminish the fact that there was also a lot of you know, trauma and pain from it. But um, I grew up in, I was born in Wales in the UK um, in the late 50s, 59 to be exact. And um, it was a very puritanical, what I describe a little bit of a sort of Bible thumping, chapel going, <laughs> puritanical, rural area. And my mother didn't fit in. She was, she was, um, I don't know how to put it. She was, she definitely sort of danced to the beat of her own drum. <laughs> And, um, and there was reasons for that. I mean, I'm very, I think um, during that time, it was sort of, you know, just after World War II, I think there were, there was a very different feeling, certainly in the UK than to here when you've had a, a war on your land. Oh, sorry, my cat just <laughs> knocked at the door there. Um, so I think there were some, you know, and there were other factors, the way she grew up and, and things like that. But anyway, um, my mother um, basically had an affair with my father for eight years and had three children with him. And um, we never met my father. There was reasons behind that. Um, he would visit my mum once a week, um, but we we lived in these little trailers in our backyard. We had a little Welsh cottage that my mum used for originally for a bed and breakfast. And then um, at some point when I was about five years old, she, because it was seasonal, the bed and breakfast was seasonal, she had the opportunity to take in a long care um, resident who had been discharged from one of the local mental hospitals and needed um, care. So that was the beginning of many, many years of my mother um, doing that as a profession. She had to raise money to, there were seven children in total. And so um, that's when I was about nine, she ended up renting this rambling old mansion and having a lot more residents that were, you know, had mental handicap uh, disabilities and mental illness. Mm. So we lived in this rambling great old mansion. Um, and my mother had this philosophy that, hey, they're just like your aunts and uncles, just, you know, roam around the house, everybody's free. There was no separate living quarters. Um, my mother actually had a separate living quarter, but the children didn't. We were all sort of interspersed around the mansion. And um, 
so it was really scary to be really honest it was very very scary for me um so that part aside um also having a father that just lived a couple of miles down the road and never acknowledged us never came to see us when we were awake so i never met him literally <laughs> until i turned 30 and um so but i would pass him in the street i, I knew who he was my mother pointed out him him to us and said that's your father and um but I just couldn't make sense of why he wouldn't want to, as I, the word I use now is claim me as his daughter. So as children tend to do, you, you create a story that it's because you're not good enough, you know? So my story in my head was if I was just pretty enough and more accomplished and clever enough or whatever enough, I had a laundry list of not enoughs mm -hmm. that he would, um, he would have wanted me, you know, as his daughter. And unfortunately, and this is what's so crazy, this is, you know, when I was psychology, I, I, I studied spiritual psychology, I love psychology as well as much as I love the principles. Um, but that you can carry those thoughts with you through time and never question them. You know, I mean, as an adult, you know, as a young adult in my 20s, to still carry that belief that the reason my father didn't acknowledge me was because there was something wrong with me. I mean, now, now I go, hang on a minute, you know, no child, certainly a young, young child could ever be that bad to not, you know, have a parent love them. It clearly wasn't the fault of a young child, but you just don't question that. Yeah. Or I certainly didn't, yeah. you know, it just didn't make sense to me to, to question that. So that was part of my unusual upbringing. Um, I also, um, Pretty much, I would say those were the most impactful um, parts of growing up. Definitely feeling, um, you know, it's so funny, even saying it these days, you know, I, I sometimes use the words, you know, neglected, abandoned and abused. And I, there's a part of me that goes, oh, am I entitled to use those words? You know, because I loved my mother so much. I felt I was betraying her. But, it, it, you know, when you look at it and you think, yes, there was abuse and there was abandonment. <laughs> And there was neglect because, you know, really having, uh, you know, your children be untended to in a situation like that obviously came with, with um, some challenges, put it that way. Yeah. So. And yet when you say those words now, <clears throat> pardon me, they seem to have a different ring to them, a different meaning for you. Mm -hmm that you're not taking them as part of your identity. But you're right. What child does not assume that they're the cause of a problem with a parent? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it's just, you know, and I also think, too, it's your, your survival. As a child, you, you are depending on the adults to take care of you. So wouldn't it make more sense to make yourself wrong and make your parents right so that you could survive, you know? And then there's also the other layer of that is if you think that the fault lays within you, then if you change yourself, you can hopefully have a different outcome. Whereas if it was the fault of a parent, you have, you have no control over that. So I think as a young child growing up in that environment, it was like, well, if it's something wrong with me and I change myself and I work really, 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 really hard, I can have a different outcome here. And I think that is at the root of many, many people who get on the self-help bandwagon. Um, it's that sort of, that's where it starts. There's something wrong with me. If I change myself, I can make other people happy. You know, so if we grow up in trauma, whether it's from, an unusual upbringing as mine was, or whether you grew up in, you know, um, a household that had mental health issues or, or addictions or stuff like that, you can, um, you often blame yourself, hoping that you get a, you get a chance to change the outcome. You know, it's, it's funny how the things that we choose to do as we get older may have that inadequacy as a base and yet people, it's like we have, we're two-sided, you know, we have the side that accomplishes things. Like you were an actor, you were a costume no. designer. Yeah, no, I wasn't an actor. I was too shy for that. Okay, well, you were in the acting profession. 
Oh yeah, I was a work. costume designer. Costume yeah, designer. I worked. I worked in Hollywood. As a, yeah, I was way too shy to be um, up on screen, but I. But I definitely. I. I I loved creating. I loved making all my own clothes when I was younger. I, we didn't have very much money. So my mother would take us to what we call jumble sales in, in the UK. And I would, um, and that was the other thing. That was the fun part of growing up with my mother. She, she had this wild streak in her that allowed us to express ourselves creatively. So I was sort of wearing 1920s sort of beaded gowns when I was about 11 or 12 and just really just crazy outfits and I learned to sew my mother was a brilliant seamstress so I learned to sew at a very early age and um you know really wanted to not ever look like anybody else so I would create these outrageous costumes and she'd let me wear them so so you were expressing your true nature yeah yeah dressing in all these exotic and wonderfully mm -hmm. wild ways yeah she used to call me a little magpie because when we would go to these jumble sales it was like I had a you know they had these it would be in church halls and they, the the walls would be lined with these tables and then just piles of clothes stuck on top of them and for some reason my eye was like anything that was shiny or beaded like the jet beads and things like that so I just just find these absolute treasures or sort of um fox stoles <laughs> I mean really weird things <laughs> you must have developed quite a reputation as a result <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah anything to get away from the catholic schoolgirl uniform I had to wear during the day <laughs> <laughs> oh wow mm. so you know what I am wondering is you are uh, active on social media you run several programs uh, you do coaching and you do mentoring. And how, with the the understanding that you have now, how does that help you in working with clients, especially the ones that we mentioned earlier who have uh, issues with codependency and n narcissism? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, obviously we are, you know, the sum of our experiences growing up. And I think... Um, just to go back a little bit, um, when I was, I was a very, very, very unhappy teenager. I felt like I couldn't cope with life. I didn't, um, at one point, I actually didn't want to be here anymore when I was about 19. I, I felt like, and again, I wasn't even blaming life. I was blaming myself. I was like, there's something wrong with me. I'm not equipped. Other people seem to be managing this life really well and I'm not. And, um, you know, and there'd been incidences of abuse and um, I just uh, was very, very unhappy. And I just so happened, well, I, I'll go back a bit. I, um, I had left home when I was 16 to go to art school. I was also, as I said, I was in one of, I was in a convent with nuns and we had a lay teacher come in and she was, um, she was like, oh my God, you could go to art school right now and finish your education there. Cause I love to draw and, and paint. And so I left home at 16, went to art school um, and did art fashion design. And then I, I'd always really loved psychology. So that was always a pull. Do I go towards psychology or do, do I go towards the arts? And then um, I decided I was gonna go back towards psychology. And um, around 21 years old, I had was given a free ticket to come to LA before I was due to go back to college in, in the UK for psychology. And so I came here and I think I shared with you the other day, I was wearing this sort of outrageous outfit I'd made for myself, which caught somebody's attention in LA. And they were like, where did you get that? And I was like, I made it. And they were like, oh my God, you can, if you can create and actually make the garments yourself, I can, you can work next week in Hollywood. And I was like, yeah, really? And, but that happened. Um, I was given a call um, and I started working immediately, even when I was on holiday. And um, so I never went back to do psychology. I, I called the college and I said, I'm sort of having fun here. And they were like, enjoy your year. Come back next year. We'll hold your place for you, which was lovely. Well, it turns out I never went back. <laughs> But there's so there's always been this part of me that that really has loved psychology. And I 
needed to make sense of my life. So I ended up going into therapy myself for 30 years. <laughs> I was also on a spiritual path. Again, it was like, I got to make sense of this. There's got to be a reason why I went through everything I went through. Um, and all of that helped incredibly. It really did. It took me from barely functioning to functioning really pretty well. But I still was had what I call codependent um, behaviors. I was a people pleaser. Um, I was always negating myself to take care of others. I kept attracting narcissistic relationships. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, low self-esteem, um, just so many of the classic codependent traits. Mm. And I became a coach, you know, after the work I'd done and after the spiritual psychology I did. And, but I couldn't find the way out. I always say it was like I could... I could work with clients and I would have you help them rather and feel seen and heard and understood and make sense of why they were behaving the way they were behaving. But I couldn't help them find the way out of that behavior because I hadn't found the way out. Mm. So when I came across the principles first in 2009, um, I didn't know it was called the three principles back then. So I just thought, you know, I read a book called Stop Thinking, Start Living, which had an incredible impact on my life but it was only really in 2015 that I really came across it again and understood that there was actually this huge community and that there were tons of teachers and um and as I shared earlier I something happened in me where I started letting go I really started letting go of this sort of codependent um behavior that was was constantly keeping me trapped in unhealthy situations and um and how I showed up to life how I showed up in the world I mean I was always settling for crumbs and um as I say shy and and insecure and <laughs> riddled with you know negative internal self-chatter but the principles helped me incredibly and um so I was just like Originally, when I came across the principles, I'd heard that there was no such thing as diagnosis and no such thing as personality disorders. So I was a bit like, oh, I can't share this anymore. And then probably about just about 18 months ago, two years ago, somebody asked to work with me. They'd heard I specialized in this area. And I was like, yeah, but we don't talk about that here. And um, anyway, the she said it was life changing for her. She was struggling in a relationship and and then I sort of thought, my God, why am I throwing the baby out with the bathwater? This is, you know, it's a three principles help me overcome this, you know, debilitating condition, really. So, you know, maybe it is okay to talk about this, to have people that are suffering know that there is a solution and there is a way out of it. Yeah. Well, so, it certainly makes sense in terms of the context in which people suffer. Mm -hmm. And what strikes me as really uh, liberating, you might say, is that in terms of creativity, that our minds can take us to the heights or the depths. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on whether we realize that we have an option. Mm -hmm. You know, that saying that suffering is an option. Yeah. Is that our minds are... Our minds are so amazing, mm -hmm. and so much of our lives, for most people, they have exactly what you're talking about, all the negative self-talk, all the self-blame, not good enough, mm -hmm. not enough in some way, you know, and yet that is, that even that is a creative act, creating yeah. that identity, and then, you know, we buy it until... Mm -hmm. We don't anymore. Until we don't. But people yeah. do some amazing things, even though they're motivated by that kind of litany of things being wrong with them. And yet, yeah. once they turn away from that, once they realize it's not necessary to believe those things anymore, mm -hmm. you know, the, the saying, don't believe everything you think, yeah. then the energy behind what it is they're creating has such a different quality to it. Absolutely. I love what you're pointing to because it's so true. Um, I used to think, as I said, that that thought in my head, I, I never knew that I did not have to believe that. 
I was under the impression that that was telling me about me and I needed to change myself so that I wouldn't believe that about myself anymore. I had no idea it was as simple as, as that's just, you know, that's just like sort of energy moving through us. And I remember when I was, I was mentoring with the Pranskis and um, I remember sharing with Linda about some of my insecure thinking. And I remember she had this look on her face was like, yeah, why are you sharing that with me? And I said, well, because this is, this is me. And she was like, and she was like, are you serious? You actually, you actually believe that stuff? And I was like, and I get this sort of look of, of like horror, for want of a better word, across her face, really had me think for a minute. I thought, really? That's an option here? I just have to, or rather, I don't have to change my thinking. I just don't have to take it so seriously because it's not the truth. Yeah. That was so liberating for me. So all those years of, you know, striving and achieving to try and feel confident in the world. And, you know, because you're right, we can be, we can be motivated to do a lot of things to prove ourselves. But what happens is when we realize we've got nothing to prove, we don't have to do it like that. And that sort of relaxes. And then we get this burst of creativity, what I call creativity from, from wisdom, from deep within us that wants to come out. It's not this sort of hanging out in your personal thinking, thinking, okay, what next, what, what do I do next to prove I'm okay, you know, or to get, you know, um, accolades or admiration or whatever it is. It's a very, very different, I mean, yes, it's creativity, it's always there. But with the sort of getting out of that personal thinking and just relaxing, it's just like the floodgates open yeah. and it's just a whole different experience. I totally agree with that. And I've had the experience of when I don't make something about me, mm -hmm. you know, this podcast, this painting, this dinner, you know, if it's not about me, I can just enjoy the process of it. And that for me has extended to my, my own well-being is that it's not about me, but it's about this this energy for me anyway it's about this energy that wants to come through mm -hmm. and what would happen if and mm -hmm. let's see and let's explore this and let's let's just find out and it, it isn't anything to do about self-worth or mm -hmm. um, uh, people pleasing anymore it's about I wonder what's going to come through what's going to happen yeah. next yeah it's and so it's exciting such a freedom to that yeah I know exactly I I you know, some people, when they first come across the principles, they have this fear that, oh, gosh, you know, if there's nothing to do, then I'm not going to be creative anymore. And it's the opposite. It's the absolute opposite. When we're up here trying to, you know, strategize and think, what can I do next? What should I do? It just, I, I find I just go in circles. But when I just relax and go, I know I'm going to be guided. It's, it's just going to come through me. I've probably been more productive in my life than ever before. And I'm, I'm pretty productive. But once I stopped thinking I had to come up with things and just was hanging out in the, you know, the um, lovely Unknown, anticipation, perhaps? exactly the <laughs> lovely anticipation of, I haven't a clue what's gonna come forward, but I'm ready. You know, it just, it just was like, I mean, to the point, and I, I'm not sure if I shared this with you, but I just, I have to have a word with wisdom because wisdom for some reason loves to download at about two o'clock in the morning with me. <laughs> and it's not, so I wake up at about two and it's not worry. It's just absolute. Um, I start writing. I start painting in my head. I just all these, it's just this download of, of stuff that wants to come through. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> just like, can you do it at like, can we like sort of reset that clock and maybe start at seven in the morning, not at two in the morning, but I don't know. That's where that, There's a very through. funny story, which you may have heard. And I, I'm hoping I get the musician right. Uh, I think it was Tom Waits who uh, was driving in his car and he started to get the lyrics to a song 
And he said uh, to whatever, wherever the, the source was, he said, can't you see I'm driving? <laughs> if you, he said, can't you wait till I get back to the studio? If you can, and this is butchering it a little bit, but you know, yeah. why don't you go bother Leonard Cohen, who was famous <laughs> for taking, you know, five years, 10 years to write a single song? Oh, that's too funny. Yeah, it is. And I, I think maybe it's because in the middle of the night, there is just so, there's nothing on your mind. So maybe it's just we hear it clearer or something like that. May, I have no idea. But but it's so I, common to wake up in the middle mm -hmm. of the night and most people bemoan the fact that we do. And yet, if we can follow that impulse, then yeah. it's not such a bad thing. Oh, I just get up and write now. I just, I just do. I write it all down because I, I used to think, oh, it's already in me. It'll come, you know, it'll be there when I need it in the morning. And then I'd wake up going, you know, it was a brilliant idea. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> so um, I've, I noticed that I go back to sleep a lot. And then also once I've written it down, um, I can just sort of, well, there, there have been nights, I have to be honest, where I've, I've got up, I've written things, gone back to bed, and then more's come, and I've gone, oh my gosh. So I get up again, and I start writing again, and go back to sleep. And, you know, occasionally it's been one of those nights where it's just, um, yeah, a few hours of that. <laughs> There's always then, naps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what do you think the relationship is between uh, creativity and spirituality? Oh, wow. Um, make it up. No, I was, I was going to say, I think it's one, one in this one of the, and the same. I mean, um, we are spiritual beings and we are, when we don't listen to that negative self-talk or that personal thinking, we are, we are pure potential. We are pure creativity constantly. I mean, we can create Every second of every day, we can have a new experience. So I think, you know, we, I, for me, it's like as spiritual beings, we are creation. We are creating constantly, whether, whether we like it or not, whether we're creating stories about ourselves in our head or whether we're creating art in the world or, or whatever we're doing. If we're doing it with um, openness and possibility, I think there's there's always a there's, whether you like I say that I mean I think regardless it, it there's something fresh and new every second available to us. And so this might be a stretch, but let's go here and see what mm -hmm. happens with people that you've worked with who have been deeply traumatized by their during their personal history. Mm -hmm. How how does that land? When you when you make that statement that we we can have a new experience every single day or even every single moment, mm -hmm. for somebody who is totally identified with being a victim and being abused yeah. for decades, yeah. Well, I I actually I I always, I always say I'm on the fringes of the three principles community, or I'm not a three principles purist in the sense that I think that you know. In, as we come into this world of form, as we call it, the physical world, <clears throat> I think that, um, um, you know, we have psychology. I mean, there is, there, people have patterns of behavior. And I think that, you know, Sidney Banks said that life is a contact sport. And I do believe that our environment can push up as, against us. It can batter us. It can bruise us. We know it can never break us, that one for sure. Um, who we are at our essence is, you know, perfectly whole and, and, and complete and never, as I say, broken or damaged permanently. But we can suffer from, um, from, from growing up in, in, in painful environments. So I'll never negate that that, you know, did not have an impact on somebody. But I think that as young children, as I said, we develop coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. One of them is, you know, to, um, to hide to not draw attention to ourselves, to, to play small, you know, so we sort of limp through life with this um, coping mechanism. And so what I like to help people see is that 
you know, that might have been necessary when you were a young child to sort of fly under the radar or to keep everybody happy, but you don't have to continue that in your adult life. You know, or some children fear abandonment and their life depended on it. So they had to learn certain things. Well, we can't be abandoned as adults. We might, we might be left, we might not like it, but we are self-sufficient. We, are, we cannot be abandoned. So I help people see where some of this thinking first took root in childhood and that maybe that thinking was appropriate for back then, but it's not appropriate anymore. We can let go of it. And we can, as, as we, we were just saying, we are infinite potential. We, we, can, we can see ourselves differently in a second. When we know that you know, we are not set in stone, our personalities are not set in stone. Our personalities are made up of thought. So just like we've had thoughts of, I'm not good enough, I'm this, I'm that, whatever, we could equally so entertain thoughts of, you know what? I'm not bad at all. I'm, I'm pretty hot shit, actually. I mean, <laughs> we can play with it. You know, we can, we can, you know, there was, I think, again, I grew up so afraid of making a mistake, so afraid of being shamed any further. And now I show up like, so what if I make a fool of myself? It doesn't matter anymore. Whereas when I was younger, it mattered so much. I was so protective. So I really help my clients see that, that they, ha they can be anybody they want to be. And it really is a playground. And, you know, when you look at young children, they don't stand on the side of that playground going, oh, I don't want to play on that toy. What if I get it wrong? You know, life is a playground. We're here to play, explore. And the big thing for me, too, is what the principles points to is the separate realities. So once I saw that, you know, I live in my own little, I use my Buddha, it's my favorite little prop, <laughs> you know, knowing who I am at my essence, that beautiful Buddha represents that spiritual essence of who I am. And then we all walk around in these little thought created bubbles. And before it used to matter to me so much, you know, do you see me? Do you like me? Am I okay? Now I'm just like, hey, you know, I remember somebody buying me a book when I was in my early 20s, it was called what you think of me is none of my business. <laughs> and I, I remember being given this book and I thought, what a stupid title. Of course, it's my business, whether you like me or not. <laughs> but now I see that, you know, yeah, I can't control how you think of me and what you, you know, my job is to answer to myself. My do job is to live authentically. I have, I believe I have a really good guidance system within me that has me um, operate from a loving kind place, but not a self-sacrificing place anymore. Not a place that was um, dependent on your approval. I don't have that anymore. So I really try and, I mean, I've, I love working in this area. I work with, with lots of different people in lots of different areas, but when in the area of low self-esteem and codependency, I just know what's possible. I just know how dramatically my life changed. And so I have so much hope that, that if I could find it, anybody can find it because <laughs> I was pretty entrenched in my um, you know, negative belief about myself. So, well, a question came to mind as you were talking, yeah. which is, how do you see the difference in terms of it not being our business, what other people think of us, since we can't control that anyway? Yeah. So what's the difference between arrogance, authenticity, and inadequacy? Yeah, well, well. I mean, I think inadequacy comes from when we're in that personal thinking where there's, we live in comparisons and judgment and fear and lack and scarcity. That's sort of happening here. From our essence, none of that thinking can happen. You know, who we are at our essence, that beautiful spiritual being, we're just sort of basking in that beautiful place of peace and love and and oneness and respect. And so 
like I said, just because I accept that I can't control how other people view me or see me doesn't mean that I'm going to become selfish and arrogant and entitled and dominate and control because I would be back up here living from a place of fear and 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 whatever that painful personal thinking when I reside in that place of loving connection and knowing we're all one I have absolute you know I am the authority of myself you know I I have a standard within me that I which is whether it's being authentic or have whatever you want words you want to use, but I have a standard within myself that I I like to adhere to, you know, um, or just be. I mean, my son often says to me, you know, why are you so loving? Now, years ago, I would have been loving to to hopefully have you love me back. <laughs> These days, I'm just loving because I love living from that place of loving. It feels so good to me. But there's a difference. It's like I'm, I'm, that to me is living from my authentic self. Before it was coming from a, I was manipulating, controlling, you know, I'll be loving to you if you love me back, <laughs> you know, that sort of feeling. So I don't know if that answers your question. So um, yeah, I, I used to be out of reference and now I'm in a referenced. Um, that would, I would say is the big difference for me. You know, I I wonder, as you're sharing this, that for many people, when, and again, this is a choice, a creative one, even though it may not be in the direction that is the most positive for us, but that so many people, when they are feeling inadequate, and I've certainly had many of those moments, turn outward to acquire something and to achieve something. And yet, it seems like the real solution is an inward turning. Mm -hmm. So it's not about achievement or acquisition, but it's really about getting a glimpse of that infinite potential that resides in us. Because Mm -hmm. if we really knew that and could hold on to that idea for more than a minute, even to say we were in any way inadequate would be ridiculous. I know, exactly. exactly. It's, it's, you know, as Dick and Betten just said, it's the drunk uncle in your head. It's just talking nonsense. It's just, it's just, it's just saying stuff. And for me, I was in that trap of more, more accomplishments will give me the confidence I, I'm seeking. More people that love me will fill that hole within me that, that, is, is this bottomless pit. But as I stopped listening to this thinking that I was less than or comparing myself to others, and the, so that was the only thing I had to do was actually not listen to that anymore, not take it seriously. Mm. As I started changing that relationship with my thinking, I naturally settled down into who I really was. So I didn't have to go looking for it or finding it. I didn't have to do affirmations in the mirror and say, I love you. I started feeling what it felt like to come from that space within. And naturally, when you hang out there and you know that you're all equal and you're all one and you're all connected, you just, it's sort of almost like tapping into, well, it's natural confidence, it's natural love, it's natural um, ease and peace and comfort. So I, I, it was so ironic. It's like I, I fell back into what was already there. I, it, it had always been there. I had just been distracted by my personal thinking, telling me a story about myself that wasn't true. So that's all it was. It was an innocent, innocent, you know, being hijacked by this personal thinking. Yeah. So as I was like, oh my God, I don't have to believe that. Not to say that it used to be in the forefront of my here, like blocking my view of the world, how I showed up, everything. And then as I started to not believe it so much, it sort of moved to the side a bit. (laughs) And then it sort of moved behind me a bit. And it was just like a little faint whisper. And it's not to say when I'm not in a low mood, it might sort of come a little more, (laughs) you know, into the foreground. Yeah. But when it does, I am like, I'm very aware of it. I'm like, oh, you're just old thinking. 
you just, you know, I don't have to listen to you. You're just visiting because I'm in a bit of a low mood right now. I just, it's a very gentle, I don't have to fight it. I don't have to grapple with it. I don't have to overcome it. I just know it's going to fade back into the background if I just leave it alone. <laughs> That's beautiful. I heard a colleague of ours recently say that she realized that uh, she really didn't care what other people think. And mm. then she had this moment of, and I don't really care what I think either. <laughs> you know, that's that's so true. I felt this the exact same thing when I started laughing about the title of that book. You know, what you think of me is none of my business. I thought, yeah, and what I think of me is none of my business either. <laughs> you know, not that's when it's coming from that place. Yeah, that's such a radical perspective. And there's yeah. so much freedom to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I have another question for you. What do you think the relationship is between creativity and empathy? Creativity and empathy. Hmm. Gosh, <laughs> I could really sit and think about that one for a long time. There'd be a lot of silence. Creativity and empathy. Well, it's interesting. I mean, as I said, I think we are, we are creation. Yeah. We are creation. So that is creativity in motion and I think that when we really live from that place of love knowing that we're all connected we're all one yes I, I as I said before I love the little uniqueness of our humanness how we show up differently but I think that when we really really come from that place of we're all one we just we ha naturally have empathy for each other we naturally care about each other we're 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 not these separate beings that need to sort of, um, you know, how, what's the word I'm looking for? That need to sort of grab and take and survival of the fittest. That's all coming from very insecure personal thinking that you're living in um, fear and, and scarcity. But I think when we are coming from that place of where we are all one, that creation, we naturally care about everybody because there is no competition. There is no need to dominate and control. And even it's so interesting you to say that because I, you know, I work with people that are recovering from narcissistic abuse. And one of the main traits of somebody that, you know, has narcissistic behavior is lack of empathy. And I see them living in this world, this little, my little Buddha again, this thought created world where they feel they need to dominate and control and, and bully and, and grab. And, you know, it's a very scary world they live in. So I don't look at people engaging in narcissistic behavior as, as horrible, um, terrible people. I know at their essence, they are beautiful, beautiful spiritual beings. They just got lost in this world of thought, this painful world where they don't think that they can survive unless they are controlling, manipulating, bullying, and dominating. Mm. So I have a lot of compassion for them. In the past, I used to think that I had to sort of stay in relationship with them or, or whatever it was. Now I know that I don't have to at all. I can still have love and I can see their psychological innocence, but I don't have to self-sacrifice anymore. Mm. I, can, I can be over here and lovingly say, you know, you have the same amount of resilience and well-being and wisdom within you, you will find your way. I don't need to sacrifice myself for you. Mm. So it's a, I, yeah, that's what came up for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, it seems to me that from what you're saying and from my own understanding is that when we are in that space of empathy and connection that a much more creative relationship can evolve from that than if we mm -hmm. if we see somebody be engaging in behavior that is somewhat destructive and mm -hmm. rather than rolling our eyes and just you know stay away yeah. is to be able to recognize something deeper about the other person yeah so that instead of responding in a very habitual, defensive way, something else is possible. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I think there's degrees. I think that there are um, 
you know, we can always see the psychological innocence of everyone, including ourselves. We are all doing best we can moment to moment, giving our, given our level of consciousness. Um, but I also, especially in the work that I do, I see that some, some behaviors are more damaging than others. Mm. And I think it's, there's nothing wrong with stepping back and just saying, and holding a healthy boundary and just saying, I can love you from over here. I can, I can, um, I can love you. I can respect you, but I don't have to stay in ongoing relationship with you. Mm. And it's there's such a freedom to that because I think anger and and uh, hatred can keep us, you know, tied in a negative way to to people. You know, I when I work with people, if there is a really, it's that the relationship is damaging. I can say you can leave with love. You can absolutely leave with love. You don't have to um, <clears throat> get to the point where you feel that you don't love them anymore and now you can leave. No, you can, you can leave with love. You can say, you know, self-preservation, it's, you know, this is, this is, the cost is too high for me to be in an intimate relationship with you, but I can still love you from over here. Mm. Yeah. Oh. When you say that we're all one, what mm -hmm. does that mean? What one, what? One, what? what one, <laughs> for me, it's one um, beautiful pulsing energy of love is the only way I can describe it. I mean, that's what it felt like when I have hit those moments. I've had a couple of moments in my life where I felt like I was just pulsing, just pulsing. And there was no separation. There was this absolute, uh, and there was two words that really come up for me that, that and then they're inadequate to describe it, but were, were, were love and the inc most incredible peaceful calm. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean by one. There was, there was just, but again, I, I, I'm very much a, a believer that, um, you know, when we say we're all one, as in we're all connected at that spiritual level, that spiritual energy that we're all sort of vibrating at, I definitely also feel that we are one, as I say, with our spiritual nature and our human nature. And I'm, I'm a, feel very sort of... Um, I think there's a reason why as spiritual beings, we incarnate into this world of form. And I don't want to do a spiritual bypass while I'm on this planet. You know, I want to embrace my humanity. I want to embrace everything that comes with that. And if I get caught up and I forget that I'm both and I end up thinking it's just me, just my little me, me Dell on my own up here. I have so much compassion for that. I don't, I don't judge it. I don't think um, there's something wrong with me. Oh gosh, you know, I should have a higher level of consciousness. It's like, no, I mean, for me, consciousness is like a sort of an aperture of a lens. It's sort of rather than levels of consciousness. I see it as there are times when I, when for whatever reason I'm in a low mood or life seems to be you know, pushing up against me where I can get a little more contracted and I can just see through a narrower lens. And then there's other times when I feel more expansive and my awareness and my consciousness grows and I'm very sort of, um, yeah, I just have a different experience of life. But I don't see one as better or one as less than, I just think it's part of the package of what it is to be human to be spiritual, having a human experience. So I'm very gentle with myself when I'm having a, a very human emotion, you know, like a, a, you know, if I'm in a bad mood or whatever, I don't think, oh, you know, there's something wrong with me. I've got to change that. I'm just like, well, whew, this energy is moving through me really fast right now. And I just am at, at peace with whatever it is that comes through me and I'll feel it fully. I had a, an experience once when I was in Peru where I, really you know had one of these experiences <laughs> where I really felt I knew that there wasn't one single thing that I could experience as a human being that was wrong not one single emotion I don't believe for a second I would have been that any of us would have been created 
with the capacity to feel, you know, what we might label as negative emotions like anger, rage, jealousy, gluttony, whatever it is. I just think that's just part of the smorgasbord of what it is to be human. And, you know, especially talking about creativity. I mean, my God, it's like as, as I, I was an oil painter for many years, it would be like, saying oh no certain colors and tones are not no no not acceptable cannot put those in your painting to me it's just like you know gives me the variety to be more creative yeah yeah i've heard it said that's just so lovely i've heard it said that we share our being our beingness our essence and that that is characterized by as you say, as love and as peace mm -hmm. and as happiness. And it's when we get that it's veiled, it becomes veiled by our thinking. Mm -hmm. And which is not to say that that is bad because it is part of life. It's like mm -hmm. a game of hide and seek, you know? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Now you see it, now you don't. And yet all of it is who we are. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. everything. We're the low thoughts. We're the high thoughts. We're everything in between. The, as you say, the whole smorgasbord. Mm. Yeah. And there's there are different, as you know, there are different traditions. Some that are more of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the monk perspective where you leave the world so that you're not tempted. Mm -hmm. And yet another route is to embrace it all because it's all can be a pathway to deeper understanding, mm -hmm. which means more creative solutions, more brilliant ideas can come through because we're embracing rather than resisting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, when you were sharing just then, I was thinking I, I used to actually, before coming across the principles, I was what we, I um, was certified as a shadow coach and, in which we all know the shadow, Carl Jung, you know, the disowned aspects of ourselves that we sort of, you know, shove in the dark and pretend don't exist. But what can happen with that is we end up projecting it on other people around us. You know, we, we sort of, and, and so you can get really into some really sticky thinking if you're doing that. So when you actually, we can get very judgmental, you know, how come they're displaying that behavior and things like that. But when you are just, when you totally embrace the totality of what it is to be human, you just relax so much. And if you're relaxed with yourself, then you're relaxed with others. That, that embracing ourselves in our totality. Yeah. It's just like, you just, you're gentle with yourself. And then again, as I say, you're, you're less judgmental and gentle with other people. And what better way to show up in the world than with that capacity for love and understanding with yourself and others? Especially these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I know we're getting close to our, our wrap up, but I do have another question for you, which mm -hmm. is what do you see as the relationship between creativity and listening? Mm. Um, I, I live a very different life than I used to. I used to feel like I was controlled by my personal thinking and I was pretty creative or it looked like it, you know, I was an artist and I, you know, was, was told I was really good and things like that. I was told I was creative, but when I stopped listening to that, and I started being more aware of wisdom, which is so um, loud and clear to me. So I listen for wisdom now, not for my personal thinking. So it's really interesting. I used to think it's like I, I have this sort of like little child part of me and I, I look up at my personal thinking. I always see it here. And it's like, you're not the boss of me anymore. It's like, you know, my wisdom is the boss of me. I, I take my orders from wisdom. I listen to wisdom. So that's what it is. And that doesn't mean that I don't engage my, my brain, my personal mind to sometimes implement some of the things that wisdom tells me I should be doing. 
but wisdom comes through with a very in such a way that I go really that that's what I'm supposed to do next all right then you know I'm following you you haven't failed me yet so it's a really that's what I hear with listening to to myself to who is really the authority of me which is my wisdom not this fearful personal thinking and when I say authority I don't mean it as in maybe that's not the right word but wisdom does not fail me wisdom is vibrant and alive and it is creativity it is our spiritual essence so the more that I listen for that with less on my mind the more um the more fun life is it really is it's like it's like Christmas it's like getting gifts you know <laughs> so and do you think that I've had my own experience with this understanding and realizing that there is a freedom that's possible that eluded me for many decades. And it just seems to me that when we understand that our lives are fluid and our minds are fluid, that we can deal with change and upset and, you know, the popular word pivot when there mm -hmm. are dangerous situations or threatening situations or even on the opposite side things that are possible beyond our wildest imagination is that when we have that understanding that nothing is written in stone yeah. and anything is possible that applies to our own psychology as well yeah. as, and the quality of our life as well and who wouldn't want that? And you know, and it's all an illusion anyway that we have control over anything. We are living in the unknown, whether we like it or not. Who could have who could have imagined that we'd all be sort of in lockdown for a year or having to, you know, reinvent ourselves through the COVID um, times? But and I always say, you know, it's so funny. We we pay so much money to be entertained. We, you know, I do certainly. And you know, I, I, I want to listen to great books or read great books. I want to go and see movies. And, you know, it's like, please don't tell me the ending. I, I want to go for the ride. Yet when it comes to our own life, it's like, what's the ending? What's next? <laughs> it's like, you know, and it makes me laugh because I think, my God, we is the only area where we get so controlling about wanting to know the outcome. Whereas with movies and books, we just are enjoying it. So I tend to try and look at my life the same way as like, I don't know the ending. I don't know the plots and twists and turns that are gonna occur, but they're gonna be exciting, mm. you know, hopefully. <laughs> That's gorgeous. So before we say goodbye, would you let people know what you're up to these days and where they can find you? Yeah. Um, well, what am I up to? I'm, I, I coach. Uh, it's one of the main things I'm, I, I do, which I love. I hold different programs. I hold programs for codependency and recovery from narcissistic abuse. I also do, um, uh, I'm in partnership with um, Andrea, um, Andrea Valelli, and we do um, a women's mastermind, eight week mastermind that's just about to start happening. And that's just all about the principles, nothing about codependency or anything like that. And um, yeah, one on one coaching. And then I do my podcast, um, YouTube show called Insightful Conversations, which might be going through a change. <laughs> so very excited about that. I've had this inkling that this change has been coming for probably about three or four months now. And I I, I was just very patient. I was like, wisdom, you are going to tell me what it is when it, when it's when it's right. Um, I just knew change was coming. And then last week, I just had one of those two o'clock in the mornings and I it came to me. And so, um, but that's in the work, so I can't share that yet. But there will be a, um, a different podcast and a different show coming, coming up in the next couple of months. Wonderful. I think that's about it. And, oh, and, and I'm writing a book. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> yes, so, yeah. So where can people find you? Will you tell us your email, uh, sorry, your website address again? Yeah, it's just uh, dell80jones.com. And um, um, yeah, you can contact me through that. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to um, meeting new people. 
I love what I do. And I love, I mean, there's nothing more rewarding than when you see people just like, like unburden themselves of these shackles that they've lived within for most of their lives and just completely and utterly see what what's possible with pure potential. I love that. And we really, really are. We can make up our lives moment to moment. So let's do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. lovely. Thank you so much again for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's been wonderful. I really, really loved hanging out with you. It's been great. So thank you. Thank you thank for you inviting so me. Thank you. And thank you everyone who's been listening or watching. Um, we appreciate your being here and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.